In Fargo, a city of 90,000, the largest in the state with hundreds of neighborhoods and businesses in direct jeopardy, residents left nursing homes, patients left hospitals, and homeowners said a hasty goodbye. Yeah, we're packing up, loading the cars, um, grabbing the cats and going. It's my home. I don't want it to go. If we're going to go down, we're going to go down swinging. South Fargo is being described as a war zone. Camouflage trucks stand at almost every corner, and every able body is busy preparing for battle. 80,000 volunteers, men, women, and children working day and night, assembly line style, filling sandbag after sandbag, exhaling, and doing it again. With a renewed sense of urgency, truckload after truckload carries sandbags into neighborhoods on Moorhead's south side. The overland water continues to plague the Timberline and Fox Run editions in southwest Fargo, where homeowners wage a desperate battle. What National Guard troops are trying to do is raise this dike eight inches to a foot to protect those nearby homes. But to give you an idea of just how far this river has come up, take a look at this basketball hoop here. From the ground to the rim, 10 feet, right? How high do you hope to take this? A uh, foot and a half above the deck, 40 feet. 40 feet up. You moved into this new addition, I assume you'd never bargained for this. Never. We said, build as high as you can go. And who would have guessed at 42 feet elevation that we'd be dealing with this? Five adults and a 14-month-old child required an airlift from the Coast Guard while another 13 stranded residents were whisked from flooded areas by airboat. 500 soldiers from this area, members of an infantry unit with the Minnesota National Guard, they've been called to active duty and plan to stay very active. But the mayor here said today there's just not enough time to raise the dikes above their current height, so sandbagging will stop this evening and Fargo will await its fate. We never know whether or not we're going to have another spring flood next year. I mean, even on the years where you don't think you're going to have a problem, it's always something in the back of people's minds. Even though we didn't think that it, it would impact us, it certainly did. You can replace stuff, but if you don't have the right level of protection, somewhere along the line you're going to have loss of life, and that's, that's the most difficult. I just hope that we can be protected. I mean, it just... I don't know what would happen in this community if we aren't. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's bigger than a lot of people want to think about because it's frankly scary, you know, that downtown would be gone. We're one weather event away from being in that situation. Uh, and relying on college students like myself at the time and relying on our high school students is not permanent protection. So in 2009, I was a senior at Concordia College. And for those that remember the flood in 09, you know, we had these sandbags built, we had the, the, the levees and the flood walls built, and then all of a sudden, the, the map changed again. We, we, we had an additional melt, additional proje uh, projections. So in communities like over in Rose Creek, we had to go back in and now we had to add two feet onto these flood walls that we thought were already built. During the day we were sandbagging at Mickelson Park at other neighbors that called a, you know, called a line for help. And at the night I was actually building pallets to raise things off the floor of my garage. Well, just north of downtown, you'd think you'd be insulated from things. We're not next to the river. We're a quarter mile or more away. And here we sit with me raising things up in the garage, with taking things out of the basement. It's hard to process that. It, it, you think you're safe when you're in town because you're not next to the river. You think you're safe because geographically, boy, I'm so far away. It's not the case. 
we talked about how excited we were and we did it and stuff. The real truth is we took some big risks with people and um, it turned out well, but a second time might not. We had that blizzard that came right at the end and so we're out there having to you know, beat the sandbags with baseball bats trying to break these up so we can lay them down to make sure that the homes are protected because otherwise, you know, all of their belongings, everything they had was at risk. We have a, a significant coolie that runs adjacent to our backyard and that was the site for a significant sandbag a levee. Um, we had heavy equipment running through our streets, through neighbors' yards. It's, it's a dramatic effect on you know the whole community uh, both from a business perspective but emotionally too. In our building which predominantly at risk was our our main site in Moorhead it's everything do our boilers still work because we're still talking about a time of the year that's very cold um, as important do, do your sewer and water uh, supplies work. I struggle with having my daughter having to sandbag take days off from school and go throw sandbags again like we did when we were little like our parents did, like our brothers and sisters did. That can't happen anymore. We had roads blocked off, we had um, schools out, businesses weren't open. And particularly um, one night when I came home from working on the temporary levees, um, I realized that the, the crest level had been increased and that meant that my house would have been susceptible to flooding had an emergency dike or levee failed. Back in 2009, that huge flood, my wife was nine months pregnant, and she is due about the time the river is gonna crest. And they were closing hospitals and highways, and we were kind of flipping a coin, um, wondering if we should go up back up to Rose Road and War Road and have the baby, or over to Fergus Falls. And my wife and I had a long talk one night about what happened in 2009 and how worried we were that um, you know, that we were going to have to leave home to go and have a baby. And that just, you know, rekindling all that, all those memories kind of just struck me. So I became a firm believer in the diversion. But until the, you know, that period of about a week to 10 days where it really escalated, um, you couldn't believe that this was a reality. In terms of total cost, I can't even put a price on it. Just the transportation alone had to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, for the state of Minnesota, I'm sure well into the millions in terms of total costs. The impact on our folks, it's hard to quantify. It, it does really wear people down. Staff, uh, residents, anybody um, associated with Eventide really felt the impact afterwards. Uh, so it's, uh, we were fortunate, we had no deaths, as, uh, which is what we were told at the time, fairly common when you have to relocate that number of vulnerable adults in a very short period of time. During any flood event, there's significant impacts from emergency measures. I mean, really, the communities of Fargo and Moorhead, they shut down. They pulled you know, people into sandbag. They tore up neighborhoods. They literally dug from people's backyards to get soil. It was a major disruption to the community. Um, people likened it to a war zone after it was done. And that was just the flood fighting measures. There was a cleanup effort that had to come on the heels of that. The roads were tore up. So there was a lot of damage to the community just from a flood fight that was successful. And as we saw in Grand Forks and in Minot, flood fights are not always successful. And the recovery from that can last decades. Every spring, this is a question that comes up. Are we going to be dealing with the flood this spring? And it's one of those things that starts to cause questions and efforts into the business. And then it also starts to cause an impact to some of our workforce issues. Uh, so we are working to recruit and retain talent on a continuous basis. And so you're recruiting and bringing in talent from different markets. And if every spring we're dealing with flood efforts on a continuous basis, it's one of those things that if we could just mitigate it, it would be one less thing to worry about. What we have to recognize is that the threat of flooding is real. That's impacting everyone who's going out and buying a home. They're, they have to check the flood map, see where they're going to be. 
Uh, that's a concern for everyone in my legislative district. Uh, that's 82% of my constituents are in the flood zone. Uh, they're in the flood map and they'd be required to have flood insurance. And we have roughly 30,000 people a day that come here to work. And it's not just from Cass, rural Cass. It's not just from Trail County. It's not just from Steele County. They come from Becker County. They come through all through Minnesota. Those are the people I care just as much about because we in North Dakota make up roughly 20% of the overall economy. And we've seen what happened out west with the slowdown in oil. Well, what would happen if 20% of the state's economy completely collapsed for up to 10 years? Once the Cheyenne and the Maple, uh, these tributary rivers, uh, get to the significant uh, flood elevations, it starts breaking out along the river corridor, and really it just starts overtopping, you know, one road, filling up that next section of land, and then that, that water just keeps marching north and east towards the Red River. So a lot of homes have to put up temporary sandbag levees or other uh, temporary uh, flood protections and then it cuts off access to a lot of homes and that access is critical in that you know a lot of people are either boating in canoeing in putting on the waders and waiting in to get to their home and it's not just for a handful of days in a lot of cases it's been uh, two three four weeks and here in the valley if it breaks through one location it goes for miles this there is as far as the pancake and so it spreads out so far. This spring, we, over 80% of all of our county uh, sandbagging and efforts went to rural areas within the diversion protected area. All of those areas will, will be protected with the diversion. So with any project, we, as we said, there's going to be impacts, and really that comes from taking the water and moving it from within the communities of Fargo and Moorhead. That water has to go somewhere. But in reality, when there's emergency measures put in place, the same thing is occurring. However, when you do emergency measures, there's no compensation. Uh, the landowners just take those impacts on an annual basis as much as there's an emergency flood fight. For a permanent project, however, when we move those waters off and we move them off permanently, then we get to compensate. So in many cases, you'll be seeing impacts to land with emergency measures that you'll also see with a permanent project, but with the permanent project, you're compensated and emergency measures, you're not. Something a lot of people don't understand, especially outside this region, is that the floodplain is always changing. So while you know a neighborhood or a particular resident might be protected in Moorhead today, uh, that very well could change um, a few years out as floodplain is remapped. Over 60% of our residents live on the or work on the North Dakota side of the river. And uh, for Moorhead residents, our only hospitals, our only emergency rooms are also on the other side of the river. 
And um, you know, we need to remember that, the disruption that it does cause. With the state of Minnesota, um, we started planning and building levees. But um, those levees won't be adequate if the diversion is, is not there. Um, we would have to totally redo what we've already done if it's not there, just to get the 100-year protection. And, and what the diversion does when it's completed with what we're doing, it gives us 500-year protection. Since 97, six of our top 10 crests have occurred in the Red River here in Fargo. Uh, since 2009, uh, we've had four of our top 10. This isn't an issue that's going away. It's really a matter of when, not if. And we need to make sure as a community that we're providing our residents that assurance and that protection that they need. We're trying to assure all of our citizens that they don't have to worry about those things come a, a flood, for example, uh, of, of an epic proportion that happened to Grand Forks. Grand Forks took up until, I think, two or three years ago to get back to the baseline elementary school enrollment they were in prior to the flood they had. So their 10 or 15 years to get back to break even, that, that's lost in perpetuity. You'll never get that back. And that's the thing that concerns me more than just myself and my business. It's the bigger picture items. It's making sure people in Detroit Lake still have a job tomorrow. So when we're talking community-wide that we're at risk of losing $50 million a year in flood insurance premiums, just vanishing out of our market, you know, that's money that families could be spending, you know, providing for themselves and their kids. That's money they could be investing into our market, into our retail shops, into our restaurants, uh, going out to our entertainment venues. I mean, that's vital to our economy. And those insurance costs, they are increasing each year significantly. Um, while it may not be a government or a city cost, that is a huge cost um, for our residents. All told, about 23% of the state's population will live within this protected area. Um, and on the flip side, right now, 23% of the state's population is at risk of, of losing our, our homes and businesses and livelihood. Uh, you know, currently, and you can see in these pictures, we use school children to help us with our flood fight. Um, and the Sandbag Central, uh, you know, the, the Cub Scout, the Boy Scouts come out, all the high school kids come out, schools shut down, the college kids are expected to fight. That's how we do a f flood fight. So this is, this is a tough thing for us. Uh, it's a huge medical center here. Uh, you know, we provide a lot of services for the rest of the state. We just, we just cannot continue to be so vulnerable to the weather. And well, the flood protection, it means a sense of comfort, not only for those of us uh, that live in the community, live in our communities, but who work here as well. And not having to continually every spring look over your shoulder, uh, are we going to have a slow thaw this year? How much snowpack do we have? Are we going to get a spring rain that's going to create problems we didn't see coming? And so I would say uh, as much as I commend all of the work that's been done, particularly on the Moorhead side, I think everybody in the community feels strongly that we need something uh, more permanent. Anybody that lived through 09 knows why it needs to happen. We have implemented um, levees um, and flood control devices, uh, but those are only going to protect us to a certain level. And they aren't going to allow us to be able to fight floods that are um, a higher frequency than what they're designed for. The diversion project really provides us that capability to be able to fight um, very massive flood events and that is extremely important uh, for our community to have that level of safety. Yeah, within the feasibility study, so starting back in 2008, we looked at hundreds of different plans, hundreds of combinations of those plans. You know, we looked at in-town levees, we looked at upstream storage, we looked at uh, the diversion channels, we looked at combinations of all those storage in different locations. And really what we found is that the diversion channel uh, through North Dakota is the best plan. And that's the plan that everybody wanted. As we were going through the feasibility steps, um, both Minnesota and North Dakota went to DC and asked um, the Assistant Secretary for the permission to go with the North Dakota diversion. That included the governor of Minnesota, um, high-ranking officials from the Minnesota DNR, and of course the governor of North Dakota and high-ranking officials there. So everybody was on board with the North Dakota diversion. That's a plan that everybody supported. Uh, the federal project includes uh, three very important components that all work together 
such that a 100-year level of certifiable protection can be provided to the metro. And it's the southern embankment, it's the diversion channel, and then it's the in-town levy features that um, are mostly in, in downtown Fargo, Moorhead, and then um, there's some levees up in Mickelson and Elzagel as well that have been built as part of the project. So together, all of that works to provide a very robust level of flood risk management to the metro area. During the feasibility stage of the diversion project, the Corps of Engineers looked at uh, a lot of different uh, project concepts or alternatives outside the diversion channel that's being proposed. One of those was the levee alternatives to construct levees throughout the cities of Fargo and Moorhead. And what we found out is that we really weren't able to provide that 100-year accredited uh, flood protection for the two communities with that. And it, the only solution to provide that 100-year accredited protection was the diversion channel that's being proposed. And this was something that's actually discussed further at the governor's task force level as well. So we reviewed those again. Uh, and continue to confirm that the levy alternatives were not the solutions for the metro area. It would be very costly. You'd have to buy out, uh, I think it was estimated around 1,500 additional homes between the two communities of Fargo and Moorhead. Uh, the cost was essentially the same as the diversion channel. That doesn't provide the robustness of the diversion channel to be able to fight against those larger events such as a 500 year flood where the, those levees would potentially overtop on that 500 year event. And then also uh, with us being located in uh, the old glacial lake bed of Lake Agassiz, there really isn't high ground for us to tie into. So we'd be looking at almost a ring levee around the community, the entire metro area, including the western side of West Fargo. A diversion channel is the safest, best way to move water. As you all know, levees are great, but once they're overtopped, you've lost, you've lost your infrastructure, you've lost places where people work and live, you've lost hospitals. And then with, with the upstream southern embankment, of course, that provide, that's a dry dam that provides the storage we need to prevent downstream impacts. It was uh, very thoroughly studied and everybody on the team wanted to make sure that we had the right plan. So we would have very large technical meetings, all day meetings, where uh, you had the, the best and the brightest in the room um, working to come up with the best plan and then you'd have somebody like Mark Bittner say, what about this? We need to look at this. We need to make sure that we have answered the questions on every alternative. And so that's what we would do. Um, so we are very, very confident that we looked at everything and came up with the best plan and then we optimized it as well. We would not have gotten through the flood fights in the past without the Corps of Engineers and our community. The community was getting tired, extremely tired. In 1997, that was what I was considering the flood of the century. And then 2009 came and we succeeded. We were asked to uh, evacuate our city and we said, no, unless the river gets to 42 feet. And we didn't. I don't want anybody to be faced with that decision again in our lives just because it's such a devastating statement to say, we want you to evacuate your city. And Denny stood up and I stood up and we said, no, we're not going to evacuate our city. We're going to stand and hold and we've defended the city and we're confident that we're going to get through this. By the grace of God, we did get through it with sandbags, but that's not the best way to fight a flood. The best way is to have permanent protection. And the difference between 97 and 2009 was the water that was standing between here and the wild rice. I think that this uh, Fargo-Moorhead diversion project is a, is a very, very good project, something that we want to continue to be a partner in, and I think that the people of this region ought to be proud in the leaders who have taken the bold step to be able to go down this road. And sometimes it's not a perfect solution. Everybody doesn't necessarily get everything you want, but I think this solution has come together uh, is, is certainly a, a very, very good solution, and one we've got to continue to, to build and be able to get in the ground. Permanent flood protection will add another dimension to this community. It's been good so far in the Fargo Moorhead West Fargo community. We've had good growth. Uh, having permanent protection is vital to ensuring that that growth is able to continue.
we're asking the state uh, to come forward with a commitment that we haven't seen for flood control projects in the state of North Dakota before. This is a, this is a huge commitment, no doubt, no question about it. But we're protecting $20 billion worth of property valuation in Cass County. Within the, the flood protection area, we have 25% of our state's GDP. 20% of our state's population is being impacted by this. So if we want to talk economic realities for our community, not just locally, but for our state as a whole, we know that ensuring that we don't lose this money and having it vanish from the market in the form of premiums that the federal government is charging us is vital to ensuring that our economy is able to continue to grow and prosper. I've been very, very impressed just in the last two years with the great work the two governors have done to be able to find what we took, what we thought was a good solution to make it even better. Uh, so they've definitely got skin in, the diversion authorities all in, both of the mayors, Fargo and Moorhead, the rest of the teams here. And we've seen great support from Congress. Uh, I think great support from the Corps of Engineers, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. So um, our commitment is to continue to be a strong member of that team from a technical perspective to give whatever advice we can. If there's ways we can find, uh, either do something faster or, or a better value, we certainly want to do that. I help work with local leaders to craft the legislation for the state commitment uh, of $450 million that then was added $120 million for in-town flood protection. Um, but really the blueprint was established in the legislation in the state senate. So as we stand here today with the sales tax that the citizens have uh, resoundingly said yes to as a local share, to the state commitment that's been center stage and steadfast since 2013, and now the federal piece uh, with construction funding available uh, has tied this all together. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's a complex project um, with a lot of moving parts. Um, but um, with all the financial acumen of outside help and assistance and our local talent, uh, we've been able to put a sound plan together that's, um, as we know, has begun. We're treading new territory for the federal government to in embark on a P3 project. So I think a lot of eyes and ears will be on watching what's going on here in Fargo with this project. Uh, at the end of the day, it's supposed to provide a more efficient, well-managed pro program project and a much more cost-effective project because the private sector has to put skin in the game to make investment as well as the public sector. And so long term, uh, I think this is a wise, um, best case uh, scenario or example, if you will, for the federal government to learn how we manage this project. From an economic standpoint, from when it comes to flood fighting for our region, this is the best solution for not only our urban areas and urban residents in Fargo and West Fargo, but also for our, the rural residents of Reed Township, Stanley Township, the cities of Harwood, Horace, and, uh, and these other rural communities. You know, when I you talk to people, um, maybe in town, that saw some flood work and, and some flood wall gates getting uh, closed, um, but they, you know, it didn't seem like that big of a, of a flood in town. But out in these rural areas, it is significant. And when you start talking, you know, road damage uh, to not only our county roads, but the township roads, it is a significant impact. Um, you know, people's homes, the access to their homes, and the roads that, uh, that they need to travel on. It is so calming and, and uh, beneficial emotionally for people to have protection that you can't hardly put a price on that. That's, that's really a, a value. And again, there's, there's financial, there's certainly a cost to building a project, but there's an economic cost if you have a flood that's, that's way beyond just the, the physical cost to your infrastructure and like. It's really important to keep people safe. And, and, and what there's so, I don't know how you put value necessarily on that, and that's what a flood protection system can do. This is Cass County's uh, permanent flood protection plan.